Hi, my name's Drew, and today I'm going to be walking you through the Ibex 20 BHS. We're going to start right up front here with the coupler and the loading and unloading procedure. So, uh, the way you want to start out is with your coupler in the unlocked position. It is going to naturally stay uh, held back in that unlocked position. So, from there, we are going to lift the, uh, or raise the jack, I should say, three inches above your ball. We are then going to center your ball underneath the coupler. Of course, at that point, we can go ahead and lower the jack back down on top of the ball. Once fully seated, we're going to slide this uh, latch forward. We are paying special attention that both of these teeth are resting there flush on the frame uh, and that they are fully engaged. Uh, once you are fully locked in here, uh, feel free to go back with a secondary pin, uh, not included in your purchase, but to go ahead and pin back this coupler. Uh, that's going to keep it from rattling uh, going down the road. Uh, can also be used as a security feature as well. Uh, from there, we're going to go ahead and we're going to cross our tow chains uh, underneath the coupler. So they're going to be crossed underneath the coupler. Now it is, it is state law in Texas that they do need to be crossed underneath the coupler uh, as well as it is illegal for them to make contact with the pavement at any time. So make sure you're skating that line of having enough room to make your turns left or right but not so much room that these may make contact with the pavement. So what we have here uh, riding right next to those tow chain hooks on the receiver is going to be your emergency breakaway cable. Now this is a very important safety function. Uh, if you were to have any separation of these tow components as the two vehicles separated, it's going to act like a ripcord to the electric brake system, uh, essentially stopping a runaway uh, camper scenario, something like that. So it is very important again that you use a quick link carabiner uh, anything that you have to attach this separate of the tow chains, so a third connection point. Uh, also, in that scenario, you're going to have a, uh, your seven-way cord here. This is going to plug into the corresponding receptacle on your bumper. This is going to give you full function to your tow vehicle's charging system, braking system, marker lights, tail lights, things like that. Uh, make sure this is fully inserted and the cap of that seven-way uh, receptacle is resting uh, behind this little piece of plastic, that's going to keep that cord in, uh, keep it from inadvertently getting pulled out. Hopping right up here to your electric tongue jack, uh, does have a light, gives you a point of reference, and not only if you're backing up to the unit at dark, uh, but if you are doing any unloading or loading, uh, it is going to light your way in those scenarios. Does have an on-off toggle switch here on the jack itself. Uh, up or down operation clearly marked on the momentary switch here. Uh, in terms of direction of travel. So very easy there. Now if you have some sort of power loss situation, you can go ahead and remove this uh, rubber cover here. That's going to expose a drive nut. You're going to line that up with your crank handle here. That will allow you to maneuver that jack up or down again in the event of a power loss situation. Hopping back here to your propane cylinders. Now you have two 20 pound propane cylinders here with the unit. Uh, this is the most common propane receptacle, so you can take that and have that exchanged uh, at any filling station or have them filled uh, at an RV dealer or something, a, you know, a propane dispensing station. Uh, separating those two tanks is going to be an automatic switchover regulator. Uh, now, you would have that directionalized towards your primary tank. If you had both of the service valves on top of the tank open, once it depleted that primary tank, it's going to automatically switch over to that secondary tank. Now, if you want to go ahead and get that primary tank filled while you are using that secondary tank, you are going to have to manually directionalize that towards that secondary tank. Uh, a little hard to see, but you do have a flow indicator. If we were to look at that regulator head on, uh, of course, it's going to pinwheel over to green if you do have flow. Uh, within the system and then of course if you have no propane it is going to be uh, red and then a little further back we have your group 24 deep cycle interstate battery uh, now this is a lead acid battery so what that means for you is a small amount of maintenance uh, once every 90 days we're going to go ahead and remove these vent panels we're going to inspect the water level and we are going to be refill uh, with distilled water as necessary so we are going to make sure we are maintaining that water level uh, also, a good thing uh, that you have here is a battery disconnect switch. Uh, what that's going to do is isolate that battery from that 12 volt system. With any 12 volt system, we have nominal or phantom draws within that system. 
Uh, from the day to day, that's no big deal, but mo compounded uh, over a few months of storage, it will wear and tear on the battery. So uh, when taking the unit into long-term storage, very easy, just flip this into that off position. That is gonna isolate that battery and that's gonna keep that in nice tip top shape. Uh, moving on here, uh, one thing we didn't talk about uh, is your propane cover here or your rot guard for these tanks. This, does, this just does slip over top and it is held underneath with a bungee cord. This is gonna protect those tanks, uh, not only from weather, but from road debris, things like that. Uh, just keep in mind that there is a bungee cord that keeps that uh, held on uh, on the underside. A uh, large pass-through storage compartment here. Of course, nothing that we need to talk about too much on there. Uh, it is nice that you do have the magnetic hold opens on each one of those compartment doors. Uh, but again, a ton of storage here right up front. Keep in mind that the things that you do choose to store up here will add to your tongue weight. So if you are close uh, in your tongue weight, keep in mind what you are storing uh, right up front here. Now on all four corners of the unit, we do have stabilizer jacks. These jacks are for stabilizing the floor, uh, keep it from feeling like you're, you're walking around on a couple tires. Uh, they are not for leveling. So for leveling front to back, we're gonna use that main tongue jack. Leveling from left to right is gonna be done with the tires and what's called a leveling kit. So your choice of leveling kit, they make a multitude of different options. Uh, once you are within three degrees of level, we are then going to run these stabilizer jacks down. Uh, it is gonna be best suited to use a light touch. So come down, make contact with the pavement, and maybe a quarter turn more just to sure everything up. Same on the way up, no need to go overly tight and uh, you're going to use this crank handle to extend or retract those uh, paired with this drive nut here. So it's just gonna slip on there. It's going to allow you again to crank that up or down. Right beside that pass-through compartment door, we have your water sources. So what we have up top is going to be your fresh water fill. Uh, if you're doing any off-grid camping, boondocking, anything like that before you get there, you're going to take a drinking water hose you're going to uh, insert it right there. You're going to fill that up uh, until you are satisfied with the amount of water in the tank. Uh, once you do so, you cap it off. Just to keep in mind that you do uh, need to use that onboard 12 volt water pump to pressurize that tank and draw that water from the tank to the fixtures and make it usable. Uh, down below that, we have your city water connection. Now water pressure becomes very important when we talk about a city water connection. Uh, these units are designed to have a working water pressure in between 40 and 70 PSI. Uh, what that means for you is that you always should use a water pressure regulator. Uh, with any water pressure regulator, we're going to hook that onto the spigot side of the hose or directly to the water source. We are then going to take our drinking water hose, hook that directly onto the water pressure regulator. And lastly, we are going to connect to the camper by rotating that camper bound connection. Very straightforward. Uh, always, always, always want to use a water pressure regulator. If this were to get lost or damaged, uh, make sure you do go ahead and replace this before taking the unit out. We do not recommend running your camper uh, without the water pressure regulated for any amount of time. So keep that in mind. Uh, if we take a look down low here, we have your freshwater drain. That's going to be how we drain that freshwater holding tank. Uh, it does just have a screw on cap. Uh, very easy, just go ahead and remove that cap. It's a gravity feed setup, so your water will then evacuate the tank uh, and collect here in this location. Uh, anytime you are storing the unit for more than seven days, and I'm gonna hit on this quite a bit throughout the camper or throughout this presentation, uh, anytime the unit is gonna be in storage for more than seven days, it is very important that we, pour, we, that we purge or empty all the water from the system. We wanna make sure we are storing it dry. Uh, slide out uh, does carry some maintenance here. Now this is the Schwintech system. Uh, what that means is you have two independently geared motors pushing that slide in and out. Uh, it utilizes these tracks top to bottom, left to right to do so. It's very important that we do lubricate those tracks every 90 days. What we're going to use is a dry silicone lubricant, comes in an aerosol can. We go ahead, we spray the tracks down, top to bottom, left to right again run that slide in and out a couple times uh, to distribute that lubricant, and then we are good for the next 90 days. Now on that same maintenance schedule, it's very important that we do go ahead and treat or condition these seals as well. Uh, they get dried out here in the Texas sun. So once every 90 days, we're gonna use an RV grade seal conditioner. Again, aerosol can, spray it down, wipe off any excess. Uh, and then you're good for the next 90 days. Now keep in mind that you do have 
uh, seals, not only the seals that we see here that wrap the slide fully around, we also have a set of seals on the inside because it does seal in both directions and it is very important that we do condition both sets of seals. Uh, moving on, we have tire pressure and lug nuts are a very important thing to talk about. Now you're with any uh, camper tires or trailer tires, you run them at the max tire pressure rating, which for us is going to be 65 PSI. So it is very important that we do run these at 65 PSI. You can find that number not only stamped on the sidewall in that traditional location, but you can also find it here on the tire data tag uh, that we have here noting 65 PSI. Now also, those lug nuts have been torqued down to 100 foot-pounds here in the shop. The manufacturer recommends a retorque procedure. That generally entails the initial 15, 25, 50, and 100 miles. It's very important that we stop at those intervals and we do check and make sure those lug nuts are maintaining that level of torque. Uh, you're going to use a click style torque wrench, a, really any style of torque wrench, uh, to know that you have uh, tightened them to the correct level of torque. So it is very important. Manufacturer further recommends that at the start of each trip, there on after, that we do check again and make sure they are maintaining that 100 foot-pounds of torque. Uh, what we have next is going to be your six gallon water heater. Uh, now this is a dual source water heater. It runs on 110 volt electricity as well as propane gas with 12 volt direct spark ignition. Uh, now manufacturer has very specific uh, maintenance uh, steps and things like that that you do want to make sure that you are uh, following. And again, if the unit is going to be in storage for more than seven days, we do need to drain the water heater separate of the rest of the system. And again, it is very important, not only from a safety standpoint, uh, or it's not only important from a maintenance standpoint that we do it properly, but also from a safety standpoint. So uh, what we're going to do is number one, we are going to give it ample time to cool down, uh, generally two or three hours at least. Uh, from there, it's very important that we do depressurize it. Now to depressurize it, we are going to cut the overall inflow of water to the unit as a whole. What that means is that if we are utilizing the city water connection, we're gonna physically turn that valve off or disconnect the hose from the unit. If we're running off of potable water, we're gonna turn off that 12 volt water pump. So with no new water flowing into the unit overall, we are then going to depressurize uh, the water heater. So we're going to go to the hot side of any, uh, of any fixture within the unit, uh, and we're going to open up that valve on the hot side. Uh, what you'll see there is a little bit of water expressed from that location, so generally maybe some steam, something like that. What you're doing is you're blowing off the excess pressure from the uh, hot water holding tank directly. So once you've done that, you're free to go ahead and drain it. What you're going to do then is you're going to come here with an inch and an eighth socket, extension, and ratchet, and you're going to go ahead and back out that drain plug. Once you've done so, the remaining water within the hot water holding tank is going to evacuate from that location. Uh, now, before returning the unit back to service, the manufacturer recommends that you kind of do a reverse, a, a, a very, very similar procedure to depressurizing it to actually prime or pump six gallons of water into the unit. So uh, what you're going to do is, number one, you're going to replace that drain plug. Uh, once you've done so, we're going to then introduce an overall inflow of water to the unit. So once we have fresh water running into the unit directly, we're again going to go to the hot side of the spigot. We're going to turn that on again or open up that valve. Once we see water flowing from the spigot, you're going to, uh, you're going to notice that it is uh, very interrupted. That flow is going to be very spitty, very interrupted. Uh, what it's doing is it's displacing the air within the tank here and replacing it with uh, six gallons of water. So once that flow normalizes at the fixture, that is your indicator that you do have all the water, uh, or excuse me, all the air purged from the tank. It has been refilled with water and you are clear to start heating that water. Uh, what you're going to do to choose your source, uh, you are going to either turn this toggle switch on to go ahead and turn on that 110 volt heating element uh, here at the water heater itself, uh, or if you are utilizing uh, the propane side of things, you're going to do that uh, in the bathroom of this particular unit. We're going to get eyes on that switch and we are, will uh, make sure we do talk about that when we do get to the, the restroom of the unit. Uh, now, at this point, I, I refer to this uh, as a drain plug and it certainly is a drain plug. Now, it does pull double duty. It is also an anode rod. 
Uh, what an anode rod does is it acts like a magnet for hard water deposits, calcification, things like that. They deposit onto that anode rod and eat away at that as opposed to the inside of the water heater. Uh, what I'm getting at is that it is a consumable part. We generally see our customers get a season or two uh, of camping before they need to go ahead and replace that anode rod. So keep that in mind. It is a consumable part. You will replace it. You will be replacing it. Uh, when you start out, it's going to be about 12 inches by 3 quarter inch in diameter. By the time it needs to be replaced, it's about the size of a pencil and looks very decrepit. So uh, keep in mind that you are inspecting that every time you are draining the water heater and you are draining the water heater anytime the unit is going to be in storage for more than seven days. So keep that in mind. Uh, other than those things, this is also a very uh, large intrusion point for mud daubers and flying insects. It is very important that we further screen off these louvers and this grating here uh, to prevent those insects from nesting within the appliance. Uh, that not only goes for the water heater here, but it goes for all the propane appliances and I will again bring that up as we go uh, throughout the unit. Uh, dropping down low, we got quite a bit going on here. Uh, if we look underneath the door here, we have your low point drains. Those are the lowest point in the unit's plumbing. Uh, that's how we're going to drain everything in between water source and fixture. Now, just to kind of bring everything home, uh, when we are storing the unit for more than seven days, it is very important that we do drain everything from the water, or excuse me, every, all the water from the unit. So to do so, what we're going to do is, uh, number one, we're going to drain the freshwater holding tank if it's been in use. Uh, that is what we saw up front, just removing that plug. That's going to be a gravity feed system that will take care of the freshwater holding tank. We can then come here to the low point drain. These have physical valves, so all we have to do is open those valves. Once we've opened up those valves, this is again a gravity feed system. It's going to drain all of that point A to point B plumbing. From there, we're going to hop up to the water heater and we're going to drain that, uh, again, following those recommendations that I outlined previously. If we've done all of those things, this unit is ready for storage for an infinite amount of time. You don't have to worry about any uh, bacteria or anything growing within your freshwater system, so keep that in mind. Uh, also, right beside those uh, low point drains is we have your dump valves. Now, they color code these gray for gray water. Gray water is going to be anything that comes from the sink or shower. Black water, or black for black water, is going to be toilet waste, body waste, anything that comes from the toilet. Uh, it's very important that we keep these valves in closed position. We're going to use the monitor panel on the inside. And we are only going to dump as necessary. Very important, especially with this black water tank, that we allow that to fill up. Uh, and we want to keep that in as wet or flowing condition as we can. So uh, we keep that valve in the closed position. We do nice long, flush it, nice long flushes. We use a single ply RV grade toilet paper. We use a chemical treatment. Uh, and a deodorizer, things like that. So uh, keep the black water valve in the closed position. Again, we want to make sure that we are not uh, plugging that tank up with that solid body waste. Also, uh, treat these two valves like a vacuum lock. They should never be opened at the same time. We want to make sure that we are avoiding any cross-contamination or anything like that. A popular option when it does come to dump is going to be go ahead and, and opening up that black water valve, allow that body waste to go ahead and evacuate uh, once we are certain that, that it has evacuated, we close that. We then open up the gray water, uh, being the relatively cleaner of the two, that's going to, rot, uh, that's going to rinse any shared plumbing uh, between the two. Uh, so this is what they call your bayonet fitting here. This is where all of your wastewater is going to be evacuated from this location here. Now your sewage hose uh, connects the very same way this cap comes off. So you have, uh, you have four prongs along the outside. You put this in the halfway position or you put your sewage hose in the halfway position. You go ahead and give this a twist. That's going to go ahead and lock it on. Now again, uh, to beat a dead horse, even when you are hooked up to full-time septic, this black water valve and it needs to be in the closed position. So just, just remember that. And I guess I should tell you how to open up these valves. Uh, it is very easy. It is just a six inch pull uh, towards you with either one. So, uh, Moving on, up top here, another storage compartment, nothing too crazy. We do have that magnetic hold open as well. Uh, a lot of storage here on the unit, which is a great selling, uh, selling point. Uh, we have cable satellite inlets here. 
Uh, just a pass-through cable connection to the designated TV area of the camper. Uh, hooks up like any RG6 cable fitting. Uh, this is again just going to be the inlet of those services and they terminate at the designated TV areas of the camper. Uh, right beside that we have your 30 amp 110 volt power supply. This is your cord, comes with the unit, is 30 feet in length, is only going to plug into the camper one way. So if we go ahead and look there at the plug, you see you have two slant, uh, slanted receptacles in one L shape. If we go ahead and match up the shapes, plug it straight in. We're then going to give it an eighth inch to the uh, eighth, an eighth inch turn to the right that locks it on. And then if we look further down the cable here, we actually have a coupler that we could feed up and screw down that to lock that on uh, a little bit further. Keep anybody from maybe tripping uh, over the cord or having it become uh, disconnected prematurely. Uh, tube storage bumper here on the rear, uh, great for any sewage hose uh, that you may have. Does have a cap, removable on each side. Uh, don't need to use it for a sewage hose, you can use it for any long storage that you may have. Uh, rooftop access, uh, rooftop access is going to be via the ladder here. Uh, now, on that same 90 day maintenance schedule, it's very important that we do talk about structural maintenance. So anywhere where two pieces come together on the unit, uh, you are going to see some silicone. Uh, it is very important that uh, once every 90 days, we go ahead and inspect, inspect every piece where two pieces come together on the unit, and we're gonna touch up any degradation in those seals, any peeling, any cracking, any separation. It's very important that we do go ahead and touch that up to avoid any water intrusion. So uh, you're gonna use a 100% silicone product here on the walls, uh, on the side walls and everything you see here uh, on this surface. On the roof, what we're going to use is a self-leveling lap sealant. Uh, generally, you'll source that from an RV dealer. If you see, any, again, any degradation in those rooftop seals, you're going to go ahead and you're going to touch up with that self-leveling lap sealant as needed. Uh, moving on here, uh, full-size spare, of course. We also have your black tank flush here. Uh, now, this black tank flush is an excellent, excellent uh, appliance. It corresponds with a jet inside the black water tank and it's specifically designed to help blast off any compounding of toilet paper body waste. Uh, it's an excellent appliance again or feature to keep those sensors uh, nice and clean and reading correctly. Uh, how this works though is you want to be very very careful again that you utilize it, it properly. So you're going to hook any old garden hose up here uh, and allow water to rush into that tank. Uh, now what you're going to do is you're going to make sure that that black water valve is in the open position uh, to avoid uh, overflowing that tank. So if we leave that black water valve uh, in the open position, or excuse me, in the closed position, what can happen is it can overflow that black water holding tank. Path of least resistance is going to be the rooftop septic vents. Uh, what I have heard of happening is that once it overflows that tank, uh, overflows those septic vents, and then you have your black water coming uh, from your roof line, which is of course uh, never a good thing. So make sure we are uh, operating that properly. They do give you a nice caution sticker to remind you uh, on the proper uh, usage of that. Uh, moving on here, uh, I love this kind of outside kitchen area. Uh, what it's going to do is what we're going to use to, to uh, feed propane here to this griddle is going to be a quick connect propane line. Uh, that is going to connect here uh, on the undercarriage of the camper. It's going to utilize this lock collar and valve system. So you slide that locking collar back, you're going to insert that male end fully. Uh, once you are inserted, it's going to snap back and then we need to go ahead and turn that valve into the on position. Uh, now propane is going to be flowing through that appliance or through that, that uh, hose to the appliance. Keep in mind that while you are, while that valve is in the on position, you cannot connect or disconnect. So it does have its own kind of secondary safety feature. You do need to turn that valve in the off position. Make sure once you're done using it, you go ahead and replace the dust guard that's gonna keep any road debris uh, from the uh, deposited into that connection. Uh, now you have a little cooktop here or a little uh, shelf or, or cook surface, I should say. Uh, this is very easy to remove and connect to uh, this uh, rail. Uh, what you do is you start with it face up like so, flat against the camper, make sure it's down as far as it can go, and allow that to go ahead and swing into place. Uh, do make sure that you have this uh, folding leg, uh, again, in the correct position. 
Uh, when it goes to remove it, you just go ahead and, and follow that. Make sure you tilt it up. That will allow you to remove it, uh, store it as necessary. Now we have your cooktop here. Uh, lighting this is very easy because they give you an igniter built directly into the appliance, which is uh, really cool. So what you would do is you'd momentarily remove the griddle. Uh, you are going to, of course, with it connected to propane, you're going to remove that so you can go ahead and inspect it. And what you do is you, you slide this in from the off position. You rotate that uh, counterclockwise until you hear that click. Once you've heard that click, uh, if you don't see fire here, then we're going to have to reset and we're going to do that over uh, until we see the actual burner here. Once we have fire here, we of course replace this cooktop and allow that to go ahead and start uh, heating. Uh, now removing this for storage is very straightforward. You go ahead and of course remove the griddle. Uh, then you have these, these uh, rails uh, held in with these cotter pins. Uh, to go ahead and, and remove. So you go ahead and remove those cotter pins and then this very easily just slides off of there. Well, maybe not super easy, but definitely doable. So uh, make sure you slide that off. A lot of people like to go ahead and take this griddle and flip it upside down and store it like that. Uh, just kind of makes it a lot smaller, compact of a package. So that's up to you. Uh, once you have the, uh, the, the griddle removed from this uh, rail, you can go ahead and remove that. This very easily folds up. So these legs fold up. Everything stores nice and compact. Uh, also in that location, we have a, a, a little sprayer port here, which is cool. Again, it's gonna utilize that quick connect style uh, fitting. Uh, again, insert the mail in fully till it clicks. That's gonna go ahead and pressurize this hose as we can see. It's gonna go ahead and pressurize that hose. Uh, this would be again, helpful to uh, do any cleanup here in the cook station. Uh, very easy to connect and disconnect uh, that hose. Uh, your refrigerator vent here. Uh, now, this doesn't carry a whole lot of maintenance. It's not really what we would consider a customer serviceable unit. Uh, all of your controls are gonna be found on the inside of the unit. Uh, it is our recommendation that you do give this a visual inspection a couple times a year. Make sure uh, no insects are in there. Make sure you don't see any dirt nests or anything like that. Uh, make sure no frayed wires, uh, yada, 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 no, crack, no cracked propane lines, things like that. Uh, big thing with this though is going to keep those mud daubers and flying insects from nesting within the appliance. So uh, what, you're going to do, what you're going to use is again those store-bought bug screens. We'll make sure that they're in place here over this grating and that's going to go ahead and keep those insects out. Now when removing and installing this vent, you're going to put the tabs down first. Make sure they're fully seated. You're going to be lining up uh, these pegs with those holes. Sometimes it can be a little tricky. Once everything is sitting nice and flush, we're gonna go ahead and lock it on by going and turning these guys here. Uh, I always go back, give it a, a little tug, uh, make sure that it is in fact on. A lot of people use, lose these on the road uh, because they do their, their visual inspection and then they don't put this back on properly. Uh, so just go ahead and double check, make sure it is in fact uh, latched on there properly. Uh, furnace vent here, so, uh, kind of like the refrigerator, not something that we would really consider a customer serviceable unit. And it is also very important that we do protect it with mud daubers, uh, protect it from mud daubers and flying insects uh, by utilizing those screens. Uh, but also with this, this is an exhaust vent. It's very important that we do make sure we let it exhaust. Uh, here in this kind of porch space, uh, I could see this getting uh, someone putting like a lawn chair or something up in front of it. Uh, do make sure that we are not restricting that flow. It does blow very hot air when it is on it is gonna go ahead and melt anything that you go ahead and put in front of it. So keep that in mind. A uh, couple all weather 110 volt outlets next to that. Uh, excellent for powering the boom box or charging phones, whatever you wanna go ahead and power out here in this porch space. Uh, those 110 volt outlets will be helpful for that. Uh, up top here, we have your uh, hood vent. Uh, now, it's very important that we do open this before we prep a meal and that we do close it uh, before going down the road. We wanna make sure we keep any road debris out and we wanna make sure that we do go ahead and 
uh, allow any exhaust uh, from cooking to go ahead and um, be evacuated. So this particular one, uh, I believe is just a friction fit. So if you go ahead and you can see the little snaps on there, uh, those do just go ahead and snap. Uh, if you're a short guy like me, you'll probably need a step stool uh, to go ahead and, and push those in and they look a little stiff. So uh, you may have to, to work them in. So um, next up we have your RV grade or RV style assist rail. Uh, does lock in that extended position. Uh, is foldable, so you'll lift up on it, fold it against the camper. Some people like to fold it against the door. It makes them feel more secure when they're traveling. Uh, there is no wrong way, so whatever you feel makes you most comfortable, uh, knock yourself out. So we have your entry steps here. Uh, now these look like just normal everyday entry steps, but uh, these have a really cool feature. So these actually have a leveler uh, built into the actual step. Uh, what that's going to do is that's going to give you further support uh, and stabilization uh, no matter what the ground grade is. So you can see you have multiple positions here. We can actually uh, pin that in. Uh, but then we also have uh, these adjustable feet. So what you would do is, of course, you would choose the setting that would be most closely uh, to your ground grade. And then you go ahead and pull this spring latch out, uh, choose that foot, and then just for for giggles here, we'll go ahead and put this in, something like that. Of course, we would do the same uh, to that other leg, and you can see that that would go ahead and make contact. Of course, that would, that would follow suit if it were pinned back, uh, but you get the point. It's a really, really cool feature. It's nice. Uh, these steps are always generally kind of uh, bouncy or, or uh, you know, they lack a little bit of stability. Uh, if that's an issue that you have found, uh, you will enjoy these steps. And then to go ahead and make sure everything uh, fits back there into the step, we make sure that those are uh, back in their home position. And then we go ahead and pin those legs back uh, with these pins. Something like that. Uh, if you don't want to use the foot, you don't have to, but it is nice again to have that option. Uh, when it does come to stow these for travel, uh, bottom uh, flips over the middle and then they all kind of accordion uh, in there and out of the way. So very nice there. Uh, moving on, uh, again, the other side of your large storage compartment. We saw, the, of course, the uh, driver's side of that at the start of the video. And I think that uh, that is just about covering it here on the exterior of the unit. We're going to go ahead and hop on the inside and take a look at those features. All right, so right here inside the door, uh, quite a bit going on. If we go ahead and we start low, we have your uh, fire extinguisher. Uh, it's very important, not only with the fire extinguisher, but all of our safety equipment that we do go ahead and test it every, time, every single time we take the unit out. Uh, with the fire extinguisher, we have a little test tab. We push that back. If it springs back, that means there's still pressure in the unit. It's still good to go. Uh, if it stays depressed, it's time to go ahead and yank it out and uh, replace it. Uh, coming up here, we have a couple USB chargers, uh, excellent uh, for any USB driven uh, appliance or if you're charging phones or whatever, uh, just a couple USBs. And then uh, coming up here, we get a couple hooks. Uh, we have this space age contraption uh, here, which is a, a bottle opener. Uh, I'm sure everybody knows how to use one of those. Uh, we have uh, your JBL mount here. So what this is going to utilize is this uh, waterproof, waterproof Bluetooth speaker. Uh, that's going to go ahead and mount up there. Uh, if you want to go ahead and pull it outside to listen to some tunes out there, uh, of course it is easily removable from that mount. Uh, up further, we have uh, your interior light switch. Uh, that's going to control uh, most of the interior overhead lights. Now those all do have a switch uh, on the actual light fixture. Uh, you can control which ones come on and off with that switch. If we push dead center there on the fixture, you can see that that light uh, is no longer controlled by that switch. Uh, and then we have your porch light. Now this porch light's on a three-way switch. So if that switch is resting in the middle position, that's going to be off. Uh, one way is going to be a orange uh, or amber bug light. Uh, the other way is going to be a bright white LED to actually light that space. Uh, and then we have your awning light switch here. Of course, that's on a lighted switch because uh, if that gets turned on inadvertently, you want to make sure that you know that they're on. Uh, and then we have your slide room in and out switch. Now, 
just a moment or something I do want to clarify there on the slide out switch. Now this is that Schwintec system and it does have those two independently geared motors that are pushing that slide in and out. Uh, with that Schwintec system, it is very important that we uh, go full travel. So if we're coming in, we want to come all the way in before stopping. If we're going out, we want to go all the way out. We want to avoid short bursts. What can happen is since it is two independently geared motors, that if you are apt to operate it in that capacity, uh, that it can actually uh, jump a tooth and, and kind of bind in its opening and then it's not gonna go in or out. So it is very important to remember, fully in, fully out, and you'll be good to go. Uh, awning, extend or retract. Now this is a, a momentary setup. Uh, let's see if we can actually see that awning. Uh, if you want to stop that in the halfway position, you sure can. You can follow that sun in the sky. That awning is going to be more stable the closer it is to the camper. Uh, use that to the benefit. If it's a little slightly gusty, you can still run that out partially. Now keep in mind, these awnings are very expensive. Uh, you do not want to replace one. They are rated for a nice, clear, sunny day. So you don't want to test uh, their, their wind durability or anything like that. Uh, we're not trying to go wind sailing or hang gliding or anything. So keep in mind uh, that if it is windy, make sure you run that awning in. Uh, do not ever leave your campsite with that awning in the extended position. So keep that in mind. Uh, moving on here, I guess, uh, transitioning here into the bedroom area. Uh, starting, I guess, underneath the bed, just so I don't forget about it. Uh, we have your inverter down here. Uh, now this is really cool. This is actually the location of the inverter. Uh, although when using it, you don't need to, to access this location. I guess if you were utilizing this for storage, uh, keep in mind, uh, this does put off a, a little bit of heat. It doesn't get too crazy or anything, uh, but protect it from damage. Of course, if you are storing things underneath here. Uh, now I'm gonna leave this up so he can get the shot here of the actual on off switch to that inverter. Uh, very easy. If the LED light is on, that means the inverter is on. Now, every single unit with, or every single receptacle within the unit is on that inverter. So, uh, which, which is super cool. On a lot of these units with the inverters, you'll only have like one outlet that is actually inverted. Uh, and, and maybe I should back up. What that inverter does is that it's actually going to switch your 12 volt power or change your 12 volt power into usable 110 volts so you can charge laptops. Uh, run, you know, just about any low draw 110 volt appliance. So keep that in mind. Um, and that does, again, go with all or, or power all of the receptacles within the unit. Um, and if that if that LED is off, that means the inverter's off. Uh, now, also, it, it's good to mention that you have a GFI protected outlet here in this corner. Uh, all of the outlets within the or receptacles within the unit are essentially tied to that outlet. So if one of them were to get overloaded, it's going to all come back to this outlet. Just like at your bathroom at home, you know, you may need to reset that from time to time. If you see the green light on, that means everything's working properly. If we go ahead and reset that and that green light comes off. So we have lost functionality to all of our receptacles. So we would then come here and then we're going to go ahead and reset that to, to, uh, to, to uh, allow power back to it. Um, so we have uh, wind, uh, <laughs> all of the windows within the unit are going to uh, essentially operate the same. Uh, they are all going to have these pull down shades. Uh, very easy to do. Uh, these are, are tensioned here by these strings. So generally as they age, uh, bouncing down the road, uh, they may lose their tension. Uh, you can very easily, and it looks like the manufacturer already has done this quite a few times, uh, you can easily just, just wrap it around another wrap. Uh, that's going to you know, put a little bit more tension on that. That's going to keep that from falling down uh, on its own. Something to remember there. Uh, we, of course, have your TV above that. Um, very easy, 12-volt TV. Uh, you can see it is uh, multi-positional. Uh, very important to remember when going down the road that you do buckle it in. There we go. Uh, and then of course you have these buckles here and I haven't adjusted this, so I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna stumble around this any longer, but uh, make sure you buckle it in, uh, snap it like you would any buckle. I'm gonna go ahead and pull that out uh, so we can talk about your antenna booster up top here. Uh, now this unit has a omnidirectional digital over the air antenna. Uh, what that means is that you can take advantage of any digital over-the-air programming. Uh, to do so, this red light needs to be in the on position. We have a switch right next to it. 
uh, to turn that on and off. Uh, now, if you are utilizing a park cable service, what we saw there on the outside, uh, keep in mind that the antenna booster and the rooftop antenna share that pathway with that cable line. Uh, more often than not, uh, these are wired in such a way that you can kind of do either or. So uh, you probably are going to have to turn that antenna booster off to allow that cable signal to bleed through. So just keep that in mind. Moving on further, um, I guess I should talk about how these windows actually operate. Uh, they have a little uh, locking tab here and it's, it's kind of spring loaded. So if you go ahead and, and lift up on that, it's gonna allow you to open the window. Oftentimes the screen will come with you. You just slide that back over. Uh, and again, that's, that's the same uh, with all of these windows uh, that you see. Uh, except for the fire exit, which we'll get to when we get to the dinette. Uh, here you have this really cool uh, backlighting here in the cabinets. That switch is here uh, right on the side of the cabinetry. And then we have, a, a, again, a set of USB chargers uh, on each side of the bed, which is also a cool feature. Uh, not going to spend too much time here on the cabinetry. Uh, it's a place for all your stuff. So... Um, what do we have over here? Uh, a couple 110 volt outlets on that side as well. Those are not GFI protected, but it's nice. You have, you have outlets on each side of the bed. You have USBs on each side of the bed. Uh, makes it easy for people that need CPAP machines or things like that. I believe that inverter would power a CPAP machine. So uh, you do not have to fear going kind of quote unquote off grid uh, if you have uh, one of those things. Um, we have your smoke alarm here right above my head, runs on a nine volt battery, same, uh, you know, same variant you're gonna find at home. It's gonna let you know when it needs to be changed. Uh, best suited to carry a spare nine volt battery uh, so you don't have to remove it when it starts going off at uh, 3 a.m. letting you know that it needs to be changed. Uh, transitioning, I guess, here into the dinette area, emergency exit here. Uh, if your entry door is, happens to be blocked uh, by fire, you can, of course, exit through the slide here. Uh, you have these two latches here. If we were to go ahead and undo both latches, that whole window, pane and all, is going to swing full out like a doggy door, uh, allow you to exit uh, from that location if you are particularly motivated enough. Um, also, this does make a secondary sleeping area uh, other than the bunk beds and the main bed. Uh, what you do... Uh, this utilizes what they call a pedestal style uh, setup. So what you do is you go ahead and you work this tabletop loose from these uh, support posts. Uh, you, once you've done that, you go ahead and uh, momentarily put the tabletop to the side. You go ahead and remove those uh, support posts from the flanges on the floor. And this is all friction fit, so it, it may be a little tough, but you, you work it loose. Uh, once you have those uh, support poles out of the flange, you go ahead and you get rid of those. And then you get the tabletop again, and you're going to set that tabletop on these bumpers here. So you have those bumpers there. Once you've done so, you go ahead and you take the back cushions here, and those are going to fill in the space there on the mattress. And voila, you have another sleeping area. So keep that in mind. Uh, also storage under each one of these. So again, make the, make the most of your storage. Uh, you have storage under each one of those. Uh, same there on that side. Uh, coming over... Uh, to kind of the bunk bed area, which again, each one of these is going to have its own set of USBs. I guess in this day and age, uh, it's nice to have, uh, to never be too far away from a USB charger. Uh, so each of these have their own set of USBs as well. And they each, their lights, I don't know if we can see this. These lights are not on that main switch. So you're going to turn those on and off uh, in the actual bunk space. Uh, and then also on the sidewall of that bunk bed, we have your thermostat for the unit. Now this is a captive touch uh, digital display thermostat. So we have a single mode button and then two temperature control buttons. So uh, if I hit that button first up that I need to choose is a fan speed. And we're talking about air conditioner fan speed. And this is going to uh, react very much like your thermostat in your house. So if I go to either a, a, like, a set, like a set fan speed, so either low or high, then that air conditioner fan is going to run indefinitely whether or not it reaches its set temperature or not. So to keep that fan kind of, um, you know, kicking on and off with, with the thermostat here, we need to keep that in auto. And also to keep that uh, fan to, or get that fan to kick off when we, um, of course, uh, choose furnace, we need to keep it in auto. So that's the most popular 
uh, option is going to be an auto. So, and that's what it, it defaults to. So we confirm that uh, setting there. That's going to take us right there into the air conditioner mode. We know we're in the air conditioner mode because it says cool and it has a snowflake and it's in auto. We set that fan speed and we have that thermostat set to 55 degrees. Um, again, up or down here arrow, that's going to uh, change the temperature. If I hit that mode one more time, it's going to take us into furnace mode. Now, once it realizes what I'm doing, it's going to kick down that or kick off that air conditioner fan. It's going to kick on the blower motor to the furnace. 16 seconds after that, it actually ignites by that 30 second mark. It's producing noticeable heat. Now, if that furnace happens to set off your smoke alarm within the first 15 minutes of operation, uh, that's not really something you have to worry about. Uh, per manufacturer's recommendations of the furnace, that's totally an acceptable uh, or totally acceptable behavior. Uh, what happens as that furnace continues to run within that first 15 minutes, that efficiency rating goes way up, it normalizes, and it should stop setting off that smoke alarm. So I, I tell you that uh, so that if it does happen, uh, you're not alarmed. And then if I hit that mode button one more time, that kicks it off. If I wait a few seconds later, that blue light's going to kick off and it's going to go into standby mode. Uh, coming uh, back around here into the kitchen, move your speaker out of the way. Uh, large uh, stainless steel sink. Uh, you have the pull down, uh, what do they call these farmhouse uh, sprayers or whatever. Uh, on the spring, you have a directional uh, on the, uh, or different flow options on the uh, head, whether it be a kind of a jet or a spray. Um, you know, countertop extender here, uh, nothing too crazy there. And then we have your suburban cooktop here. Um, this is going to utilize a piezo igniter there. So what you would do is you, you turn the burner to that light side, use that piezo igniter to go ahead and rotate until you actually see that flame. Then we can go ahead and choose the, um, intensity of that flame. Um, little light switch there gives you those fancy blue lights. Um, um, up top we have your, uh, your, your, your vent, uh, and light. Uh, we talked about the importance of making sure we open that vent on the outside uh, before cooking a meal and the importance of closing it before we go down the road. Uh, even further down, uh, we have your um, microwave, cooktop, and convection oven. These three-way grills are awesome. Uh, they can operate, again, like a standalone microwave. They also have the convection option. Uh, they also have a heating element on the top, kind of like a toaster oven. I, I love these things. Uh, they work very well. Uh, they are microwave-esque in, in design here, so, so your controls are going to be very much, you know, very, what, very much what you would expect to see uh, on a microwave. So you have, uh, you know, you choose convection, you have to choose a uh, preheat temperature uh, here on the dial. It will preheat, it'll beep to you to tell you to put your food in. Um, it does have a service manual. Uh, they are very easy to work around, but if you have any questions that aren't covered in that service manual, uh, don't hesitate to give us a call. Little further over, we have your uh, fuse panel breaker box. Um, this is going to house your 12 volt replaceable blade style automotive fuses. Of course, go to the auto parts store, pick up a variety pack of fuses, uh, keep them with the unit as fate would have it. You'll probably need one uh, if you don't have one available. Uh, and then here on the left side, we have your 110 volt uh, light switch style resettable breakers. Uh, everything is labeled in terms of function here on this sticker, so keep that in mind. Uh, these are resettable breakers, just like your breaker box at home. Uh, again, depending on the situation, you may find yourself uh, having to reset those. Uh, and then we have the road vac uh, beside that, which is a, a, a cool uh, option. Of course, they, they do sell a, a hose uh, that is compatible with this setup, a super long hose, allow you to go ahead and sweep out the whole unit. Uh, you would, of course, install that here and then go ahead and flip that switch on. Um, works very well for that. Uh, but uh, in its kind of base capacity without having to, to get that secondary hose, uh, you can use a, a good old fashioned broom, uh, sweep all your debris uh, to this location. If you just go ahead and open up that, that's gonna go ahead and suck in that debris from that location there. Uh, now. Looking at the unit, there's going to be a little hole. Uh, looks like it was made for your finger, because it was. 
you can go ahead and push that open uh, and then you can see you do have a replaceable bag. Uh, keep in mind that uh, everything that you do sweep into this is going into a bag uh, and make sure you check it's uh, make sure that it's not over full, overflowing um, and that you are changing it out regularly. Uh, up here to the refrigerator. Now, uh, all of your controls are going to be right inside the door. Uh, they went ahead and, and kind of hid that display to kind of give you that residential feel. Super, super easy uh, or basic controls. You have an on off switch and a gas switch. So if you just hit the on off, that's going to kick it into auto mode. On auto mode, it defaults, defaults to AC. If it does not have AC voltage available, it's going to automatically start lighting on gas. If we want to go ahead and purposely run it on gas, we need to depress that switch there. Uh, there is no indicator that it is in gas except for uh, the position of the switch. So pay attention to that. If it fails to light on gas, it's going to illuminate that check light. Also going to give you an audible tone, uh, letting you know that it, it didn't light on gas. Uh, moving on, I, I think I'm getting everything here. We're going to come here into the bathroom. Uh, a lot of stuff going on here in the bathroom uh, other than, than what you would expect. Um, of course, here on the wall, uh, we have uh, the light switch here. Uh, we also have heated holding tanks on this unit. So that's not something that you see every day, which is really cool if you're doing any cold weather camping uh, or anything like that. Uh, you can go ahead and keep those tanks from freezing. We also have your water pump switch here. Uh, what that does is that uh, allows you to go ahead and pressurize that fresh water holding tank uh, to bring that water up to the fixtures and make it usable. Uh, we also have your water heater switch here. Now this is the propane side of your water heater. Now we talked about how to utilize the 110 volt heating element when we were outside uh, going over the water heater. This is the propane with direct uh, spark ignition um, side of things. So uh, one thing you want to pay attention to this is this fault light. Uh, this fault light will come on when you turn the switch on initially uh, and you may see it come on and off within the first few minutes of operation. Uh, what that is, is essentially your indicator on whether or not the appliance has lit or, or is currently heating water. So um, it cycles three times. If it does not light by the end of that third cycle, it illuminates that fault light full time. All that means is that the water heater did not light. It cycled three times and then essentially kind of locked out. Um, what often happens is, is maybe the propane uh, service valve is closed on the tank itself. Uh, maybe you're out of propane uh, or uh, oftentimes when you have a water heater that is at the rear of the unit, your propane is of course at the front of the unit. Uh, oftentimes it just hasn't made its way through the line by the time that that has cycled three times. So uh, go out, make sure you have propane in the tank, make sure your valves are open if you've done both of those things uh, and that fault light is on. Uh, come in here, flip this switch off, flip it back on, let it cycle another three times. Generally, if it, it has not made its, the propane has not made its way through the line, it will light up on the first try of that second cycle. Uh, and then we also have your solar charge controller in here. Uh, now this isn't going to, this is, this is going to be a, a um, your charge controller. This is going to give you a visual readout of where your batteries sit in level of full. Uh, things like that. It's not going to really do anything for us here because we don't have the unit completely set up uh, But it's going to give you how many amp hours you're taking in via solar uh, Where your battery currently sits in voltage things like that. So uh, Essentially just the brains to the solar uh, Solar system. I, I hate saying that because it makes me think of the universe, but uh, the brains of the solar system uh, and it allows you, you know, to intake energy as needed, but it's not going to overcharge those batteries. Uh, also here in the bathroom, we have kind of normal bathroom stuff. Uh, pedal style flush here on the floor. Light to press to fill up, light to press to fill up the bowl, full press to flush. Uh, same here with the shower. Uh, you have a standard on and off here on the actual head that's going to help you uh, conserve water. Uh, very kind of typical things here. I'm not going to spend too terribly much time on it. Uh, you have the, the magnetic pool uh, shower curtain, things like that. Uh, medicine cabinet, again, these are all kind of basic stuff. Uh, one thing to cover is we do have an exhaust fan here. Uh, now it's important to touch base on this because these do lock closed. So you pull down there on the, on the uh, handle 
to unlock it and then you go ahead and crank that up and then you have um, fan speeds here four three four fan speeds um, and that really is it gets up and moves now that's uh, running in reverse or exhausting air that's to help pull moisture out of the air if you are uh, of course taking a shower or anything like that um, most important thing with these fans is to make sure you do close them or remember to close them before going down the road. Uh, I make the joke that it's something you forget once because it's probably not going to be there when you get to where you're going. Uh, one thing to note is once you have cranked it down, go ahead and push that handle in the up position to you hear that click. That's going to tell you that it's locked down. I think that just about covers it here on the uh, interior of the unit. If you have any questions or concerns, please don't hesitate to give us a call. Uh, we'd be happy to kind of touch base with you on some of these appliances and things further. Uh, we hope you enjoyed the walkthrough on the IBEX 20BHS. Thank you.